into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? <coughs> but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home, and when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. The Lord bless reading his There's essentially two different religions in the world. There's the religion of works who try to work their way to heaven. They have no hope of actual forgiveness of sins. Now, if you ever ask a Hindu what they need to do to reach their heaven, they say they they need to do yoga. They need to accredit as much good karma as they can and learn what they needed to learn in the past life. And, and then they might have a chance of going to nirvana, which and to them is a place of unconsciousness. So they, in order to escape their reincarnation cycle, they, they, they need to learn all this, this stuff, and they don't, aren't even sure that they'll even escape it. If you ask a Catholic, somebody from the Roman Catholic Church, how to be saved or how to, how to get to heaven, they'll say, if they do all the sacraments and avoid mortal sins, they might have a chance of going to heaven. I remember one time I asked my, I asked my English teacher over in Newton, I said, what, what do you have to do to go to heaven? She says, basically, what I just said, and then she said, she's not even sure about that. She might go to purgatory to work off some of her sins. And you never know when you, whether you're in purgatory or in hell, so you got to do the best you can. But the religion from heaven, the true religion, Religion is found in God's Word. In Ephesians 2 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. God says, Jesus forgives sins for all who belong to Him. What the world cannot do, Jesus has accomplished through his eternal power. What we're basically going to prove today, what Matthew proves, is that Jesus proved he could do the spiritually impossible, which is forgiving sins, by doing the physically impossible, his miracles and his resurrection. Basically, Matthew's been leading up to this point that Jesus is a forgiver of sins. And in this, in this uh, account, he is setting up for his own testimony. See, Matthew is a tax collector mentioned in verses 9 through 10. He's the tax collector that Jesus calls to himself. Nothing's known about Matthew other than he used to be a tax collector. We can tell from his writing that he, was, he very much knew the, the Jewish people and the Jewish audience. And so he's been proving that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who is going to take away all our sins. You see, he shows that he's Lord of all. 
He's in Lord of all, including the undesirables. He, in the beginning of 8, we see him cleanse a leper. We see him heal a centurion servant. And we also see him healing a woman. We see that he also is able to calm a storm and cast out demons, showing he's Lord of all, including nature and the supernatural. Yep, those are the obstacles that would keep him from being able to forgive sins, but because Jesus is God, he shows that he can forgive all sins because he has the authority over all things. This new section is when they cross over to the other side. He just cast out 2,000 demons and cast them into pigs, and the Pigs committed suicide by taking a swine dive off the cliff. You see, he shows that he's all powerful. And they and the the people in that area knew that he was all powerful, so they asked him to leave. They didn't want anything to do with, with God, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They just knew he was mightier than demons. That's all they needed to know, and they just didn't want anything to do with them because they loved their sins and their idolatry over the Savior. And so he comes to his own city. See that he crosses over, back over to Capernaum because Jesus had been kicked out of Nazareth for preaching that he's the Messiah and said, I'm not even going to try to show it by miracles. They didn't believe him. So he set up shop at Peter's house in Capernaum. And he goes there. And, then, and our Lord is faced with an impossible challenge. The challenge is, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. You see, no other, no other prophet in the history of the Old Testament has given a paralytic the ability to walk. Moses never did it. Elijah and Elisha never did it. They did pretty cool things, but they never given a man uh, the ability to walk. The ancient world wasn't made for handicapped people. If you were paralyzed, you had to depend on your family to take care of you. If you weren't able to use your arms, like Johnny Erickson taught it, pretty much had to lie there and, and accept people's pity. And it's amazing that this man's lived so long as a paralytic, but we see that he has friends and relatives that are taking care of him. It's amazing that this man is able to, has been able to survive so long. And these men carrying him on his bed, on his mat, like the mat that we see in the picture up there, We see that this man is completely bedridden. You know, they didn't have wheelchairs back in ancient times. They didn't have ramps. Things were made for regular people. There was, the ancient world was not handicap accessible. Aren't you all glad that we don't live in the ancient world? Most of us probably wouldn't even survive. And that would make sense because the average lifespan is was about 30. Women, it was about 28 to 30. People didn't live long because there's no such thing as modern medicine. Uh, the medicine they did have usually made you worse. And uh, they, they did not care about the crippled or the lame. And so, is a, which is really interesting here, is Jesus is presented the impossible challenge to heal a paralytic man. But then Jesus gives an impossible answer. He says, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. This is an outstanding thing. 
Because nowhere in the Old Testament is an angel, a prophet, a priest, nobody is able to forgive sins in the Bible. Only God's able to forgive sins. Every time you see somebody ask for forgiveness, ask somebody to pray for them that they can have forgiveness, they are not asking that one, they're not asking Abraham to forgive, to forgive them, they're asking God to forgive them and for the righteous man to pray. It's impossible for any man to forgive sins. So Jesus is actually making a claim to be God. Jesus is saying, I am God, without having to say, I am God. He does it by forgiving sins. And the scribes even realize that this is impossible. The scribes say, it said, Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. The other accounts, Luke and Mark, said they were just thinking it. They were thinking it in their hearts. See, that's a... You see, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they'd studied the Old Testament front and back. They knew God, salvation belongs to the Lord. David says, blessed is a man who the Lord does not count his sins. They knew the scriptures front to back, and they knew that men themselves could not forgive sin. But they, didn't, but they failed to recognize something about Jesus. They failed to recognize that he healed a leper. He healed the centurion's servant. He healed a woman. He cast out demons. He, he healed every disease that ever came to him. And he was able to accomplish it. God does not bless heretics and hooligans. God doesn't bless and do things for people who are totally against him. He might give them rain for their crops, have the sun shine upon them, but he's not going to hear the prayer of an unrighteous person to heal somebody like that. You know, a lot of these people in the charismatic movement think that they have the power to be able to raise the dead. You see them going out into graves and do try to raise people from the dead. They believe they have the power to regrow limbs, but you never see them being able to be, regrow limbs. You see, every single one of their supposed miracles are curing backaches, leg lengthening, which is what magicians do. They don't really lengthen your leg. They just push the other one in and pull the other one. They're a bunch of con artists. Why doesn't God actually do things for them? That's because they're charlatans. They have horrible theology. They teach that Jesus ceased to be the Son of Man when, they, when he died on the cross. They teach this, that people are little gods and God can't do anything without our, without our faith. Like God's some kind of magic genie, and if you rub the magic lamp of faith, he's going to be able to do anything for you. But Jesus, his claims were falsifiable. He did all of his miracles publicly. They were well recorded. Even the Talmud says that he did miracles, mighty deeds. Now they credit it to demons. But demons can't do Things like cast out demons. Otherwise, they'd be fighting against themselves. Demons can't give, give blind people eyes. <clears throat> they can blind people. They can make people mute. But they can't give them eyesight. But Jesus proves over and over and over again that he's able to do the things of God because he is God. 
He's the Messiah that they've long waited for. He's what I what Isaiah prophesied about being about Emmanuel, God being with us. And they said he was blaspheming. Because they knew it's impossible for anybody but God to forgive sin. But here's what Jesus says. As Jesus, knowing their thoughts, another thing proving he's God, only God knows people's thoughts. I mean, I can kind of guess what you're thinking when you look at me. If you look like this, it means you don't, I don't usually understand what I say. Or if you're like, that means you're confused. But I can't tell what everybody's thinking. Only Jesus is able to read people's thoughts because he's God. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? And then he gives, and then he proves the impossible. He's presented an impossible challenge. He gives an impossible answer, but he proves the impossible by what he does. As for which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. Now for God, it's easy to do both. God can just as easily forgive sins as he can making somebody walk. He created the entire world in six literal 24-hour days just by the word of his mouth. Just by saying it to come and exist, it came and exists. God wasn't tired when he rested on the seventh day. He was creating a week. And he was showing that humans need a day of rest. And so it's just as easy for God to give somebody ability to walk as it is to forgive their sins. But with a man, I can tell you your sins are forgiven. I can be like a priest. I can sit in a box in a confessional booth. You can, you can say, I'm sorry, Father, for I, have, for I have sinned. You tell me your sins. I say, you're forgiven, my child. And say, 40 Hail Marys, and you're good. I can say that, but that doesn't make it true. Only God can forgive sin. Through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his son. Only God can forgive sins. But I can say that real easily, but I can prove myself to be a charlatan real quick if I go up to a person who's paralyzed from the neck down and say, okay, get up and walk. Or... Maybe a less extreme example would be to say to, to Mike, do, do 50 pull-ups. I don't think I can even do 50 pull-ups. I can probably do one. Or if I say to, to anybody here, okay, get up and fly around the room. I can prove myself to be a charlatan real quick by saying that and it not happen. And so here's what he does. He gives them extra proof he's God. Extra proof he can forgive sins. And he says to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. Now that's amazing. This guy came for healing, obviously. Why else would you bring a paralytic to, to Jesus? But he says something even better than what, than, than healing him. He says, your sins are forgiven. This man was a sinner that was brought to Jesus and the thing is, everybody's a sinner. You and I are sinners. All you have to do is look at four of the Ten Commandments. How many, how many lies have we told in our life? I've told countless lies, so that makes me a liar. That makes all of you liars who've told lies. Just 
Just one lie makes you a liar, by the way. Have you ever stolen anything, regardless of its value, like a candy bar or a pen or anything? It makes you a thief. If you ever used God's name in vain, it makes you a blasphemer. And if you ever looked with lust and had sex outside of marriage, that makes you an adulterer at heart. That's pretty terrible and awful and all, and all, the, all sin. If we, and the Bible says if we've broken one sin, we're guilty of breaking all of them. We're lawbreakers. And so God has to punish us for our sin. But he did something amazing with Jesus. He had Jesus <coughs> become a man, live a sinless life, do outstanding miracles, and then he died on the cross bearing the penalty for our sin so that God could say, your sins are forgiven. This man was a sinner came to Jesus for a physical need and he got this greater spiritual need met. These Pharisees, these scribes, were without excuse. They've seen the mighty works of God and they know that Christ has the power to forgive sins. But they still don't believe. And we see over and over again we see this with the calling of Matthew when he eat, when he's eating with, with tax collectors and sinners. You see, Jesus says in verse 12 of chapter 9, it says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not called the righteous, but sinners to, to repentance. The Pharisees try to get Pharisees and the disciples of John try to get Jesus on fasting and saying the disciples don't fast. We see people mocking Jesus because he had actually healed. Uh, he, he said he was going to raise a little girl from the dead. All of these things, the scribes or Pharisees are back there questioning Jesus, mocking Jesus, trying to show that Jesus isn't, isn't really who he says he is. But every time, Jesus proves the impossible, that he is God and man come to earth. He's come to forgive us of our sins. And he did that by his miracles and ultimately by his crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. See, Jesus is Lord of all. Everything. Supernatural, natural world. He's Lord over Gentiles and Jews, men and women. He was perfect. He, he led a sinless life. Performed miracles. Died on the cross to, for, for our sin and he rose from the dead. And in all of this to forgive us of our sin. What was Jesus' mission? That was given before he was born. The angel said to Joseph, Name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You might think that your sins are impossible for God to forgive. You know, there's two types of people that I meet in the world. There's people I meet that think that they're the best people on earth, that they're God's gift to mankind, and that they do not do anything worthy of going to hell for, that they think they're horrible, rotten sinners. There's, or, I mean, they're, there's people who are good and think that they're wonderful people and deny that they're horrible, rotten sinners. And then there's people who have been broken down by life, who... Everything bad's been going on in their life. There's people who know that they're dirty, rotten, filthy sinners. They've read the Ten Commandments. They've read the Bible. They know they've broken every book, every rule in the law book. 
And you might think that your sins are too big for God to forgive. You know, sometimes this happens with Christians. Christians will repent of their sin and trust in Jesus, and they start living a holy life, and then all of a sudden they get sucked into some sin, like alcoholism or pornography, or they accidentally slip up and commit fornication. This, it can happen to Christians. Christians can be sucked into a sin temporarily. And you might think that your sins are too big for God to forgive. But Jesus just proved here that he can do the impossible. He can forgive your sins. Because he, was, he did the impossible. He lived a sinless life. He did miracles. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you have a humble heart and you ask God for forgiveness, if you cry out to Him for forgiveness, confessing your sin and be willing to forsake your sin, God will forgive you from that sin. He'll free you from sin. He can free you from all its desires, all its pulls. You don't have to keep living a life of hopelessness and doubt. You don't have to keep living a life that you know is contrary to God's will because God can forgive you of all your sin, past, present, future, if you just simply repent and cry out to Jesus today for forgiveness. We need to trust Him today. Heavenly Father, we can know our sins are forgiven because Jesus did the impossible. We know that he's provided a fountain of forgiveness by his blood that was drawn 